Hello, and welcome to Introduction to Social Psychology. My name is Matthew Poole, and I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College. In this chapter, we're going over social learning and social cognition. Most generally, this chapter is about social cognition, the mental activity that relates to social activities and helps us meet the goal of understanding and predicting the behavior of ourselves and others. Fundamental part of social cognition involves learning, the relatively permanent change in knowledge that is acquired through experience. We will see that a good part of our learning and our judgments of other people operates out of our awareness. We are profoundly affected by things that we do not know are influencing us, but we also consciously think about and analyze our lives and our relationships with others, seeking out the best ways to fulfill our goals and aspirations. Let's talk about operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is quite simply learning from our consequences. If a child touches a hot radiator, she quickly learns that the radiator is dangerous and is not likely to touch it again. If we have unpleasant experiences with people from a certain state or country or a positive relationship with a person who has blonde hair or green eyes, we may develop negative or positive attitudes about people with these particular characteristics and attempt to reduce or increase our interactions with them. These changes in our understanding of our environment represent operant conditioning or operant learning. This is the principle that we learn new information as a result of the consequences of our behavior. According to operant conditioning principles, experiences that are followed by positive emotions, reinforcements, or rewards are likely to be repeated, whereas experiences that are followed by negative emotions or punishments are less likely to be repeated. So operant conditioning is based on the law of effect, which states that we're more likely to engage in behaviors that yield a pleasant consequence and less likely to engage in behaviors that yield a negative or neutral consequence. In operant conditioning, the person learns from the consequences of his or her own actions. Now, classical conditioning is learning from association, which helps us to anticipate events. Let's start with talking about associative learning. Associative learning occurs when an object or event comes to be associated with a natural response, such as an automatic behavior or a positive or negative emotion. If you've ever become hungry when you drive by one of your favorite pizza stores, it's probably because the side of the pizzeria has become associated with your experience of enjoying the pizzas. We may enjoy smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, and eating, not only because they give us pleasure themselves, but also because they've been associated with pleasant social experiences in the past. Marketers understand this concept well. Whenever I say Red Robin, you say yum. Now, is Red Robin yum? I'll let you be the judge of that, but at least they got the idea in your head. They're associating the two stimuli together. And when I say a stimulus in this class, I mean it's anything that elicits a response in an organism. So make sure to make a note of that. As well, with classical conditioning, there have been plenty of famous experiments, especially with Pavlov's dogs. With Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov, he was looking into initially the digestion of dogs, but came to find out that whenever the researchers began walking toward the dogs with food, they didn't see or smell the food, but they associated with the food that is about to arrive. So instead of just associative learning, we're pairing two items together, a classical conditioning helps us to anticipate when an event is about to occur. So in this case, Pavlov decided to take a step further. He decided to associate the ringing of a bell with the arrival of food. Now, initially, even in humans, as well as dogs, a bell does not elicit any sort of reflex. It may get your attention momentarily, but it especially does not elicit a salivatory reflex. When Pavlov would train the dogs, he would ring the bell, and then shortly after, food would arrive. Now, really quickly, because dogs are very intelligent, they would associate the two together, and something that was once neutral, aka a bell, be now became a condition stimulus. So that condition stimulus of a bell created a condition response of salivation. Another way in which marketers may try to, or companies may try to utilize learning from association because they understand we are very much association machines, is there may be pictures of individuals who are experiencing the adverse effects of the particular product. So as you can see in the figure to the right, the goal of these images is to associate the fear of maybe potentially dying or negative health consequences with cigarette smoking. So in a way, trying to allow the individual to associate 
hey, cigarettes probably are not a good long-term play for my overall health. But it can also be, do, be used to benefit, like with Red Robin and Yum. Now, with observational learning, we know that we don't just learn by things directly happening to us through operant and classical conditioning. With observational learning, what is taking place is people learn by observing the behavior of others. This is known as observational learning or modeling to demonstrate the importance of observational learning in children. There is a famous psychologist named Albert Bandura, and Walters in 1959 made a film of a young woman beating up a bobo doll. This was an inflated balloon with a weight in the bottom that makes it bob back up when you knock it down. The woman violently hit the doll, shouting, Socceroo. She also kicked it, sat on it, and hit it with a hammer. This experiment was very interesting. If you'd like to watch a video of it, if you have the access to the PowerPoint, you can click the YouTube link or you can type in YouTube Albert Bandura Bobo Doll Experiment. What he was looking into was modeled aggression. Whenever the end, they would view the adult hitting on the Bobo Doll, if there was a reward or punishment involved as a result, then the children would follow suit as a result. Let's talk about some anatomy and physiology pre with the prefrontal cortex and learning. So the outcome of learning is knowledge, and this knowledge is stored in schemas. So schemas are a collection of related concepts, and in the brain, our schemas reside primarily in that prefrontal cortex area within the frontal lobe. Prefrontal cortex is hugely important for decision-making, problem-solving, as well as judgment. And it's the part of the brain that lies in front of the motor areas of the cortex and that helps us remember the characteristics and actions of other people, plan complex social behaviors, and coordinate our behaviors with those of others. Prefrontal cortex is the social part of the brain, it is also the newest part of the brain, evolutionarily speaking, and has enlarged as the social relationships among humans have become more frequent, important, and complex. Demonstrating its importance in social behaviors, people with damage to the prefrontal cortex are likely to experience changes in social behaviors, including memory, personality, planning, and morality. An early figure in psychology, known as Phineas Gage, showed us that whenever there is damage to particular areas of the brain, this can have uh, emotional and physical consequences, behaviorally speaking. What happened was Phineas Gage was a railroad foreman, and one day he had a tamping iron shoot up through underneath his cheek and left throughout the top of his head, severing his prefrontal cortex from his amygdala, uh, as well as the hippocampus and the limbic system as a whole. These are two structures you do not want severed from one another because the prefrontal cortex is involved in uh, the social part of the brain, planning, judgment, decision-making, and you have the amygdala, which is involved in emotion processing. What Phineas Gage experienced afterward was that he experienced severe impulsivity his sociability was impacted, so he was never able to hold down a job or form connections with people like he once did. So once a very mild-mannered, responsible individual became completely erratic, and this was because of damage to these particular areas of the brain, more specifically the separation of the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. So now let's talk about how expectations influence our social cognition or our social thinking. We're going to first introduce a cognitive process, provide the description, as well as an example. Firstly, cognitive accessibility. Some schemas and attitudes are more accessible than others. We may think a lot about our new haircut because it's important to us. Next, salience. Some stimuli, such as those that are unusual, colorful, or moving, grab our attention. An example of this would be that we may base our judgments on a single unusual event and ignore hundreds of other events that are more usual. The representative heuristic, we tend to make judgments according to how well the event matches our expectations. An example of this would be that after a coin has come up heads many times in a row, we may erroneously think that the next flip is more likely to be tails. When it comes to the availability heuristic, things that come to mind easily tend to be seen as more common. We may overestimate the crime statistics in our own area because these crimes are so easy to recall what's most accessible. Anchoring and adjustment. 
Although we try to adjust our judgments away from them, our decisions are overly based on the things that are most highly accessible in memory. We may buy more of a product when it is advertised in bulk than when it is advertised as a single item. Counterfactual thinking. We may replay events such that they turn out differently, especially when only minor changes in the events leading up to them make a difference. We may feel particularly bad about events that might not have occurred if only a small change might have prevented them. Next, false consensus bias. We tend to see other people as similar to us, and an example of this would be that we are surprised when other people have different political opinions or values. Lastly is overconfidence. We tend to have more confidence in our skills, abilities, and judgments than is objectively warranted. Eyewitnesses are often extremely confident that their identifications are accurate, even when they are not. So here's another cyclical process. When Jerry meets Bianca, who is Italian, he flirts with her. Bianca sees that Jerry is flirting with her. She flirts back. Jerry believes that all Italians are romantic is confirmed. And Jerry believes that all Italians are romantic. Therefore, once again, this uh, cycle will proceed. A self-fulfilling prophecy. Still another way that our expectations tend to maintain themselves is by leading us to act toward others on the basis of our expectations, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. A self-fulfilling prophecy is a process that occurs when our expectations about others lead us to behave toward those others in ways that make those expectations come true. If I have a stereotype that Italians are fun, then I may act toward Bianca in a friendly way. My friendly behavior may be reciprocated by Bianca, and if many other people also engage in the same positive behaviors with her, in the long run, she may actually become a friendlier person, thus confirming our initial expectations. Of course, the opposite is also possible. If I believe that short people are boring or that women are overly emotional, these are a textbook's words, not mine, my behavior toward short people and women may lead me to maintain those more negative and probably inaccurate beliefs as well. Let's talk about some things that can impact your memory, memory error. Now, there was a study conducted back in the day with Elizabeth Loftus. She recruited a series of college students. She had them watch a video of two cars hitting one another. And then there was a simple question that followed. How fast were the cars going when they either smashed, hit, or contacted one another? There were a few more that were in between smashed and contacted, but obviously there's a big difference between the severity of the word smashed versus contacted. And the simple question of how fast were the cars going when they smashed into one another provided almost a 10 mile per hour difference comparatively to the question of how fast were the cars going when they contacted one another. So we like to think that our personal recounts of memories or things that we experience are very accurate, but actually it may not be the case, even as simple as a subtle change of words or verbs in a sentence and how they are asked. So to conclude, this chapter is focused primarily on one of the three ABCs of social psychology, namely, the ways that we learn about and judge other people are social cognition. The ability to make accurate judgments about our social situation is critical. If we cannot understand others and predict how they will respond to us, our social interactions will be difficult indeed. Although we are pretty good at sizing up other people and in creating effective social interactions, we're not perfect. Errors we make frequently occur because of our reliance on our mental knowledge, our schemas and attitudes as well our tendency to take shortcuts through the use of cognitive heuristics. We use schemas and heuristics as energy savers because we are often overwhelmed by the amount of information we need to process. Social knowledge is gained as the result of learning, the relatively permanent change of thoughts, feelings, or behavior that occurs as a result of experience. Some learning is based on the principles of operant conditioning or operant learning, Experiences that are followed by positive emotions or rewards are more likely to be repeated, whereas experiences that are followed by negative emotions or punishments are less likely to be repeated. Associative learning occurs when an object or event comes to be associated with a response, such as a behavior or a positive or negative emotion. 
learning from association to anticipate events is classical conditioning. And finally, we also learn through observational learning by modeling the behavior of others. Things don't have to happen directly to us for us to learn. We can see somebody else experience an adverse or pleasant experience, and we know what the result will be. I want to thank you for tuning into this particular chapter. I hope to see you in the next one, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.